It is 12.30. Welcome, everybody, to the Sustainable Sourcing Panel. Um, what I want to do is be uh, quick, so quick introductions. I want this to be uh, interactive, adaptable uh, uh, session. So here's uh, the thought first. Who are we? Roger Martin, uh, Dean of the Rotman School at University of Toronto, and a uh, longtime school board member. I've got with me Will uh, from Psychic Ventures, Mary Jo from uh, Fairtrade USA, and Jason from World Wildlife Fund. You've got their uh, CVs. They're all super, super impressive. Uh, I don't need to go on and on about them. Um, uh, here's the thought, and if anybody doesn't like this thought, we can do something else. Uh, I will state a premise up front, uh, and then ask uh, these folks one question, go to you for which of those, the answers are you most interested in pursuing, we'll pursue those, and then we'll figure out where to go from there. So, so far so good? Okay. Yes. Prem premise is that sustainable sourcing has gone from an idea that might or might not have worked or been, been a good idea to one that has largely been demonstrated to, to work. Uh, it works for the beneficiaries like uh, uh, poor farmers. It works for the corporations who utilize uh, sustainably sourced uh, products. It has had a positive impact on, uh, on the sustainability issues associated with them. So it, I, th I think we could probably all agree that, that when it is deployed, it works. The big question, I think, for us all is how to get it deployed on a more vast, broad uh, level, because it works. It's a technology, if you will, that, that works, but it is arguably still small. Uh, it, uh, we don't have sustainable sourcing, broadly speaking, in, uh, in markets ac uh, across uh, the world. So the question that I want to pose to each of the, the panel members is the question, what are the biggest barriers? Let's say I give you three. What are the three biggest barriers or impediments to sustainable sourcing taking off and multiplying by orders of magnitude in size and, and reach and impact? What I'll do is I'll write them down, make a list, and then ask you guys what of those are the most interesting subjects on sustainability and barriers there too uh, that you'd like to have a, uh, have a conversation about and then we'll engage in that conversation. So far still so good? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Yeah. Jason, what would your, what would your top three uh, barriers to rolling out of sustainable sourcing and scaling it up be? Uh, one, the business model's not right. Okay. And it's not right because it's based on demand in the U.S. and the EU, and those are not driving global markets anymore. It's not right because none of the, of the certification programs pay, focus on productivity or net producer income. Gotcha. It's, it's just not fit for purpose. Yep. Two, sustainability still being looked at as something that you put on the shelf. I think sustainability is really a pre-competitive issue. We all need raw materials. What po products you make, how you package them, how you sell them, that's competitive. Whether they exist or not is pre-competitive. And we need to work together. Most companies don't want to work together. When it comes right down to it, Coke doesn't want to work with Pepsi. Cargill doesn't want to work with Bungie or Dreyfus, et cetera. The third is, the programs that look at sustainability and supply chains and the production of raw materials start because of impacts. They start because they want to reduce some impacts. Very few of them actually measure whether they do or not. But mostly what they focus on is the better performers. The problems are with the worst performers. The bottom 25% of producers cause 50% of, of the impacts and produce only about 10% of the production. So we're focusing on the wrong end. We're focusing on the wrong end of the performance curve. The better end, we need to move the bottom. Beautiful, thank you. Mary Jo, and it is completely legitimate to say, uh, Jason had a good one, check. Uh, that would be one of my top three, two, or three, three uh, new and different uh, ones, or some combination thereof. Jason. All right, well, um, I agree with what you've said, and what I would add to it is, um, for me, I think including people in a very um, thoughtful way 
in the sustainable sourcing conversation is huge to enabling it to scale. Because if you look at productivity only, for example, or um, environmental metrics only, and you're not actually investing in farmers so that these are livelihoods that are worth doing, I don't think you can get sustainability to work on a large scale. Um, the second one, and I think it has to do for me with the business model, is how do you increase transparency to eliminate cost and redundancy in the supply chain? Um, so that you break this myth that sustainability must be more expensive. It doesn't have to be more expensive if, if you look at the entire supply chain, right? Yep. And then the third, it's, it's kind of a different twist on your measures comment, but it's like providing enough indicators that you're on the right path and systemically. So I think a lot of sustainability solutions pick off one piece of it without being able to look at, well, wait, did we make the system change that we want to make? Perfect. That was great. Well, the, the advantage of going last is <laughs> what they said. Uh, <laughs> I, I, just to build on yeah, Jason's second on point, yes. I, I think this, this notion of open innovation or cooperative partnerships is, is a... Uh, a cap capability that needs to be taught and learned and, and adopted, and it takes a long time. So I, I see that as a, a barrier. Transparency is the lack of transparency, the lack of an integrated system um, that provides factual information to multiple stakeholders who participate in a system is something that's urgent, something that we've been you know, working to try to build and in, invest yeah. in. Yeah. Um, and I would say the thing that, 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 that I feel a lot is sort of the lack of capital that has the intention and patience to, to uh, fill in some of the gaps for market adoption or R&D to get to commercialization of new solutions where uh, major market players won't act because the incentives are not in their benefit. So um, cap, you know, patient capital to fill those gaps. Perfect. So I suggest we just go bing, 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 whoops, in that order, and then we'll, then we'll see where we, uh, uh, where we get to from, uh, from uh, there. Jason, you put this up uh, 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 first. Give us a couple more minutes on, on what about the business model uh, is not right. Then let's, then let's have a conversation. So there's a, there's a bit of a backdrop here um, that I think we need to have this discussion for all these points. So in the next 40 years, we have to produce as much food and fiber as we have in the last 8,000. Because of increasing population, increasing income, and increasing consumption. And so the challenge is how to double production on the same amount of land without increasing either the amount of land being used for food or the amount of, of pollution and, and problems coming from that. The question is which systems can do that. And so I think it really forces us to, to see which organic, fair trade, conventional, no-till, agroforestry, doesn't matter. All of them, if we're gonna take them all forward, are gonna need to double production. Which ones can? That's, that's one issue. And that's about the model not being quite right. The other issue is the rise of other countries as, as major uh, consuming areas. So we think there's a global recession, but 100 countries are growing at 5% at or more. 50%, 50 countries are growing at 7% or more. Two thirds of the world's population is in a 5% growth right now. This is not a recession. It's recession here, it's recession in the US, but it's not a recession globally. And, and what we're seeing, we've, we've mapped the 100 largest companies because those are the ones we've targeted that we need to work with. The 100 largest companies in the food industry aren't the same as they were 10 years ago. There's a lot more Asian com companies involved. There's a lot more traders that are global coming out of mostly Asia as well. And so that's what's behind this is the, is the business model fit for purpose. And then there is the little thing of, do these programs actually pay for themselves and can they go to scale? Which is another whole issue about the business model. So there's, there's separate issues coming under this umbrella yeah. Yeah. that we can talk about. Yeah, so, so, it's, so it's essentially Asia versus old world and then some fundamental business model questions. And what are the fundamental, fundamental kind of the business model doesn't, you know, if, if we had it aimed at, at, at Asia, what's the, what's the biggest barrier uh, that you see on the business model not working? I think, I think the, the biggest barrier, and it isn't just the business model, but we haven't actually proven that sustainability pays. 
And yet, all the anecdotal evidence shows that it does. And so what is the kind of evidence that we need to marshal? We've, we've looked at about eight or 10 different commodities with producers that are certified against some credible standard, could be different ones, versus those that aren't. The producers that are certified are four to 30% more profitable than their neighbors without any premiums because they're more efficient. They use resources more efficiently, they're more productive, et cetera. That's the kind of thing that we need to document, I think, to shift this. Because at the end of the day, to move the bottom, it's not gonna be voluntary programs. It's gonna to have to be the government. The government's gonna to have to get involved. They're not gonna do it if there isn't a business case. No government's gonna cut their throat by forcing people to do something that's not in their advantage. So we've gotta prove that it's in the advantage of the people at the bottom to get governments involved too, so we can shift the, the curve. Does, does that resonate with you guys as, as well? Or do you think we've got enough, we've got enough proof of uh, concept? I, th I think it's still much more anecdotal, particularly if you're going to have people make it an, a part of their a huge supply chain. I think the evidence is much more kind of case by case. So I, I would agree with that, that it has to be proven. I would also think about, you know, this comment about productivity. And I agree with productivity, but um, I, I do also think in order to scale this, farmers have to see what's in their interest and what's in their interest quickly. So for example, if a typical cocoa farmer sells $2,000 worth of cocoa a year, but has a net income of $150, and out of that he has to pay $10 per kid to send to school, et cetera, et cetera, and cocoa is really labor intensive, and so you increase productivity, but you can't afford to pay for that additional labor. In the meantime, I just don't have enough ends, money to make ends meet. Like, how much can you get that cocoa farmer to invest in the environmental and productivity things we want, unless there is a conscious not after we're done with the environment, we invest in the farmer, but rather the farmer is the solution to the problem, which I think is a, a, a bit of a different way of thinking than, than is always the case in these models. Well, we're, just, we're just at the dawn of you know, a number of multinational company leaders taking a position where sustainability can become a competitive advantage, not just as a differentiating sort of positioning idea, but actually pushed through the whole company I mean, in my experience, I've been working very closely with Unilever the last mm -hmm. six, seven, Paul, eight years. My Paul. And um, you know, we've been trying to bridge the gap between the, the innovations that are six, seven, eight years from market that Unilever is going to need to deliver on their metrics <laughs> and grow them up to a scale that they are um, impactful and meaningful and can actually be adopted and move the needle for a company at that, at that size. So we've been trying to you know, heal the, that big gap in that, in that business model to give, to give it some real relevance. That's cool. He is, he is totally, totally dead serious about this. He's a good, he's a, uh, uh, good friend of mine. He was going to be here, except he has a board meeting on the west coast of the U.S. this, this week, but was going to uh, come here to, uh, to talk about what, he, what he's up to. It probably will in a, another year. I mean, yeah, having, having uh, big companies like that just buy, buy it, I, I mean, so what is it, if we can just if we can just dive into this a little bit more I mean what what do you think it would take on the on the proof front um, does it take academic uh, uh, studies do we have to get more stuff published uh, in, in academic journals or 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 what what's because I'm I was sort of more I have to admit coming here I was more under the uh, in the view that it's now there are enough case studies out there that it is now obvious and that's why somebody like Paul just says the hell with it I've heard enough we're we're kind of going there well he's, he's also got the wind at his back right now because the stock price is at an all-time high so in terms of what validation do you have he, he you know he buys himself and the company buys himself a lot more runway when they can perform in the market. You know, in contrast to say, another experience I've had a company like PepsiCo that was trying to diversify into healthier products, more sustainable supply chain, market really beat them up for saying you're getting away from your core, your profits are dropping, and it just completely usurped their whole permission to yep. pursue that agenda. Absolutely. So I think, you know, we can't ignore the fact that the market has huge, you know, I mean, the, the market being the stock market, the shareholder value piece, um, gives a lot of runway, or not, um, to experimentation in this, in this realm. So you have, to, you have to have the vision and you have to be able to execute. 
Any, any thoughts? Yeah, Jim. My question is, who are we trying to convince? Is it the supplier? Is it the buyer? It seems like it's a lot more than governments we're trying to convince. Is yeah. it, and what is validation? Um, because it seems like if the cocoa supplier isn't interested, then they're not going to do it. And if PepsiCo, if they're buying, isn't motivated for whatever reason, they're not going to do it. So help us understand a little bit about who we're convincing and how. I can give you a real world example. Like we do some work um, with Sam's Club and they've had mandates around sustainability and, and whatnot in Walmart Inc. for a long time. Um, but on the sort of the fair trade, the, the non cost saving side of sustainability. So they've done a lot of cost savings around sustainability, but when you get to more of these like investment in their supply chain, it's driven by passion at the buyer level because it's not in his or her metrics. And so he, he or she chooses to fair trade their pound cake, which is something they've done because they believe in it and they need to figure out a way to get it through um, without screwing up all their metrics because it could be an investment up front that doesn't pay off for a little while. So part of the convincing is going, I don't know what Unilever's done, you may know more about that, but going from a vision of a CEO, which is terrific, down to how you incentivize the people who are making the decisions so those things are aligned. And that's missing in a lot of places. That, that's actually a huge issue. We, we just did a, a study, which I'd be happy to share with anybody, which, which looks at what are the internal changes companies have to make once they make commitments to external changes about sourcing products? Yeah. You know, what are the procurement changes that have to make? What kinds of people do you need in the company? You know, what, what's the capacity you need to make this happen? It's, it's a very different, none of them really are making the investments in those. Yeah. They're trying to cobbling it together as they go. Yeah, and Mindy, I was talking to Mindy Lauber, right, of Cirrus. I'll come to you in one second. I was talking to Mindy Lauber at, at uh, Cirrus last night, and she was saying, yeah, the head of CalPERS says, yes, we want a sustainable investment, whatever, but there's this big disconnect at the level of the portfolio. She's got all these portfolio managers managing this kind of portfolio and that kind of portfolio, and they keep doing what, what they're doing, the, uh, the, the easiest uh, uh, way to do it. And so not ha having that ability to go from the top on through and have the incentives and, and uh, measurement systems uh, and compensation systems al uh, aligned, at least she thinks in the, in the investment management world is a, bi is a biggie. I'll go to Will and then to you. Vince, one, uh, one thesis that I had worked on for a while was, well, we're trying to help consumers bring them the information that they need to make informed decisions. And if people have a, a sense of the understanding of the system and its impacts, they might make better decisions. We, we backed a company and spun it out of Berkeley called Good Guide, um, which provides this integrated database that delivers information you know, on your pocket genie um, to tell you the, uh, the health, environmental, and social attributes of 130,000 products we buy every day. And we, uh, and we thought you know, this would be just sort of swept up with consumer interest. And in a, in a recessionary economy, without a pure you know, economic value proposition, um, it just sort of you know, hung out there. And I mean, I've talked to Mary Jo a lot about this, but what we found was people are most interested in the health ramifications of a product or an ingredient, secondarily the sustainability or environmental perspective, and less and less as it gets further and further away in proximity. And then third and last but least is the social, you know, people don't really care. They don't, they just, they don't understand what, what that farmer, what, what it means for them not to have a place to send their kids to school, so. Yes, right here, and then Deborah over there. And just tell us who yeah, hi. Um, good afternoon. My name's Gary Milstead. I'm head of uh, commodity proc procurement for Nestle uh, for Europe. And uh, in our background, uh, creating shared value is an important part of what we want to do as, as a corporate organization. And that cascades down to our little procurement team to go off and, and make it all happen. But I have to say, just picking up the point from Mary Jo, that without the business vision, there is no way that as a procurement organization, I can just go out and buy sustainable stuff. Because, and one of the things I was keen to understand was a transparent supply chain is really important. It's part of the traceability, it's part of understanding where it's coming from and how it's produced. But the value that's attached to that, today, most of the world that I live in, there's a cost attached to it. 
So I'm very interested to hear a little bit more about how sustainability can be delivered in a cost-effective manner. I think we've, we've come up with some solutions in terms of delivering sustainability, but it's being built into the business model. And rather than looking at it as a cost, it's an investment in the brand. It's an investment in the process. So you, we've been able to switch the thinking in terms of the stakeholders with, within the organisation, in terms of what is the value this is bringing and what is, what is, how do you price that value as distinct from, oh, it's a cost. But to bring that value, there's no way I could do that independently without a, a business vision that allowed us to execute. So here, so can I ask a question? Just leave it there. Ask a question back. So, if if somebody somebody came to you, somebody credible uh, came to you and said, "I have a toolbox uh, uh, for you. Here's here's how you can work with I don't know. Let's, let's say it's COVID. Here's how you can work with farmers, and it's a prov provable uh, model. And here's how here's the results that we've had for from doing that. And here's how you can procure that. And here's how we suggest that you communicate with uh, consumers about that. And here are all the little case studies." that demonstrate that that works, and they came to you with that, with that sort of integrated uh, offer, would that, would that make it much easier for you to go to your boss and say, hey, we're doing this new, we're doing this new thing, uh, the consumers are going to like it better, and it's going to not be any more costly, can we go do it? In a word, yes. Yes, okay. So, the, the, the role so it's of an integrated toolbox. The really. role of procurement yeah. is to understand risk yeah. and also to seek opportunity. So our, our role is to bring to the business, here's an opportunity. Yep. So I was fortunate enough to work very closely on the development of the Nescafe plan. Mm -hmm. And we had a supplier, the Federation in Colombia, who had a thousand agronomists on the ground. And they were prepared to work with us on our ambition to drive sustainably sourced coffee. Yep. I was able to present that back to the business and say, this is the, our biggest source of washed Arabica in the world, and we can make that 100% sustainably sourced within a two-year period. Is that interesting for you for the business? Wow. And now all of a sudden, yeah. there's a message that we can communicate on pack about the work that we're working, that we're doing with agronomists to help farmers overcome certain problems in Colombia. Yeah, yeah. So yes, the role of procurement is to identify risk, yeah. whether it's price or supply, but also identify opportunity. Yeah. yeah. And so outside organizations can really help you a lot in Ab bringing to bear something like, like that in, in the case of coffee. That, Absolutely. that does really matter to a so procurement organization. This okay. is my second year at Skoll. Yep. And my eyes have been opened. That's why I'm coming back this year because last year was so good. Good. Because there is another world beyond just the world of procurement. Yeah. And there are opportunities and there are, there are people out there. Yeah, yeah. And seriously, there's, there's a massive... There's, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> We exist in different hemispheres, yeah, yeah, yes. and yeah. we've got to m make that bridge work because yeah. there's there's the visionary. A lot of the people in, in in this room that I've met over the last two skull forums yeah. have met with my superiors in my head office. Yes, and guess what? None of that cascades down yeah. to my little organisation, yes. who's responsible for making the contracts with the suppliers and developing the relationships. Yep. So let's build the bridge. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Deborah. I'm interested in the panel's view on whether it's reasonable to assume that there can be a compelling business model for sustainable sourcing if we do not price the cost of environmental impact into the businesses of the suppliers. Good question. Who, who'd like to take a first crack at that? I think, I think it's, it's clear that if we well, we do live on a finite planet, and we're, we have more people, and they're going to consume twice as much per capita in 40 years. So we've got to figure out how to do everything more sustainably, environmentally and socially. I mean, it's, it's, it's all part of the picture. That means starting to price externalities of all kinds into to pricing. I don't think you do that in a theoretical way or an abstract way or necessarily uh, by, by regulation, at least given the governments that we have on the planet today that can't even manage their own countries, much less the whole planet. Um, so you start, with the, too, huh? yeah, <laughs> you start with the things you can work on. Uh, and I've been doing a lot of work on, on trying to bring carbon into commodity pricing and see if companies would be willing to pay 
they're producers of raw materials for tons of carbon. It's incidental to the company uh, because a ton of carbon is worth less than 1% of the ton of any commodity these days. Uh, and so, but it's an incentive for the producer because it, it aligns the producer not only with that company, they might enter into five, 10 year contracts to supply them, but it also rewards them for doing something they should be doing anyway, increasing soil carbon, protecting riparian areas, not farming steep slopes, reducing soil erosion. The point of that is that the person or the institution that, that benefits the most from an environmental service or a reduced externality should pay for it. Well, in the case of soil carbon, it's the farmer themselves. If they increase soil carbon in the tropics by half of 1%, they reduce pesticide use, water use, uh, fertilizer use by 10%. Half of 1% soil carbon, 10% reduction. If you get up to 3%, you can reduce by half your entire use of fertilizers and pesticides. So there's a lot of ways that these make sense for farmers. Those things we can internalize, but people have to know how it works, and that's yeah. where research that's can really, and the yeah. business case can yeah. actually do it. There are some things like biodiversity at large, hard to figure out how, who's gonna pay for that, but pollinators on a farm, yes, it will increase coffee production by, by 20% if you have a beehive within three miles of a coffee farm. So those are the kinds of things we know, but we need to take them to scale. Yeah. And what's stopping that? Well, I remember the, Nature published a piece just on the pollinator thing in, 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 uh, on coffee in Guatemala, and I tried to get the authors of the piece to even model how much land you'd have to take out of production and, and what you would pay those farmers for not growing coffee in some areas to bring in natural habitat so you could get bee colonies started there and then have their neighbors pay them some percentage of the increase in production over time just to see if we yeah, could yeah, take yeah. this to scale because that's what we've yeah, got to yeah. start doing. Yeah, yeah. And they, would have to. they wouldn't do it because they're academics. Yeah. They didn't see the value. And so, and then I realized that, well, we should be talking to the government or ag extension or you know, the cooperative itself. Japanese oyster cooperatives for oysters from aquaculture actually do this. They look at production of two or 300 producers in an area, they look at which ones are the most marginal, and, and they buy them out and use those areas for wetlands and for restoration and for filtering the nutrients from the others, and then those guys who get bought out are paid off by the ones who do better. So I mean, uh -huh. th this kind of, but that's which, which what does a, need to be documented. That, that's, that's your, that's your, uh, that's yeah. your. Uh, that's because your I think, I think the yeah. thing is, everybody wants a silver bullet. They want to know what to do. Every farmer wants yeah. to know what. Just tell me what to do. I'll do it. It's not like that. It's not about what to think. It's about how to think. Because every farmer has different resources. Every company has different issues that they have to address. So the, I can't tell you with a blueprint written in stone what to do, but I can work with you about how to think about solving problems. And if you learn how to solve today's problem, you can actually solve tomorrow's problem. Yeah. So it's the recognition that these people are in a system together, an interdependent system, and that it's not sustainable right. on an individual basis. Yeah. But so that, how does that, the competitive dynamic of that work with the farmers and well, who, who wants to throw in the towel, so to speak? So I think, I think one of the things, and this is already blending into the second yeah. <laughs> point, which is yeah. the pre-competitive behavior. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that, that I think is beginning to happen is that the 21st century is gonna be in part about defining, redefining what collusion is. Mm -hmm. To me, collusion is about pricing and how you make products and how you sell products and all those kinds of things. Whether there are raw materials available or not is not collusion, that's just survival. Everybody needs raw materials. How you use them is different. So companies that have a vested interest, and there's five or 10 that have 25 to 40% of every commodity market, they have a vested interest in making sure that those are sustainable over time. They need to start working on it together. Kellogg buys from the same farmers that General Mills buys from the next week. And Nestle buys from the same producers that Mars buys from or Kraft buys, or Mondelez buys from. These things change uh, the more they stay the same. Um, but but that, these companies have to start working together. Yeah. You know, it, sounds, I mean, it's, it sounds like there's some kind of a challenge of sort of tool design and tool fit, I guess. Like I'm, I'm striking, uh, as, uh, as um, you, you, were, you were talking uh, about Nestle, 
the tool that Nestle coffee or, or cocoa procurement needs is a pretty broad one that says, here's how you deal with suppliers, here, here's how you think about uh, customers, here's how you think about what you do, and, and, and if, we, if somebody came with that tool that was nice and comprehensive and said, you know, here's, here's, here's how you can do it, that's what would be needed. That's sort of a, almost a vertical tool box. It, it sounds like there's a horizontal toolbox that's needed for a group of farmers in a, in a, in a, given, in a given area, and it, it has different characteristics and coverage than the big horizontal one, and there's, there's some big toolboxes for probably regulators, but it, it, it almost... Let's not it, get away from your vertical toolbox yeah. just yet, yes. because, okay. because I think there's a lot that companies can, can do, and there's some things they can't do. I remember we were talking with USAID last summer about a, a grant to help further the Consumer Goods Forum commitment to take deforestation out of supply chains, and they wanted the companies to come up with with grants that would match whatever the U.S. government was going to put in. The company saying, what are you talking about? We're willing to give markets. These markets are much bigger than the grants. Turned out that the markets of those, now there's about 57 companies in all that have, have more or less signed into that agreement, represent 20 to $25 billion of purchases for four commodities. Now, aid wouldn't count that as a, as a match. And so then you say, well, if, if those are certified products, in these certification programs, it's going to cost about 1% of the cost of the product. So that's 200, 250 million per year of additional revenues generated because the companies made the commitment. Aid wouldn't count it. So now we're talking to the, to the World Bank about a project to rehabilitate degraded land. And what they've agreed to do, which is totally different, is use the commitment of the com companies if they will give preferential access to the farmers that don't deforest or the farmers that rehabilitate degraded land. Yeah. Not a premium, just access. And that is a whole different thing. And, and that's looking like it could really move forward. So the president of the World Bank has, has agreed to create a fund to work on this at about $10 billion, 250 million hectares, as the target of rehabilitating degraded land. So turn the frontier inward rather than expanding further into force. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been trying to bridge between the procurement office and the R&D people and then the CEO's vision. To, so we, we've gone to the procurement people and said, well, you know, where, where, are, the, where are the pain points? And if you, if you were to value all the externalities, you look at all that packaging and you say, boy, we're not paying for the disposal of that or the, the cost of that. So that's a big one. And so you'd say, how could we... How could we deal with that? Be, okay, it'd be great if we had really, truly biodegradable packaging. Then you'd say, well, and it would be great if we had a, a really low-cost feed stock that, that, you know, that would just disrupt the costs that we're paying for conventional plastics or oil-based materials. And then, you know, and then, this, and then the health-oriented people come in and say, yeah, it'd be really great if we could take BPA out of that material because we know at some point, at some level of ingestion, it's just not good for you. It might not be material, you know, in a shampoo bottle, but it's going to be. So we, we sort of get all those inputs and then say, all right, well, where, you know, how do we build the innovation bridge, if you will? And you know, we would, so we go out and we find a scientist that's thinking about this, that's got some chemis green chemistry, you know, start a company to make biodegradable plastics from CO2, which he can do, and then you know, fund it. And then hopefully, the procurement people say, no way, it's way too expensive, it's gonna be years, I can't even deal with it. But we get the R&D people to do a partnership, a development partnership, and then we start making little amounts of it. Then the big manufacturers say, oh, that big multinational company is interested? Oh, we'll build a pilot plant. Okay? And then ARPA-E says, oh, that's interesting. You've got, uh, bio, you've got green chemistry, biodegradable plastics from CO2. We'll give you federal stimulus money. You know, and then more venture capital comes in. So this is sort of that, you know, number two, that open innovation yeah. partnership, yeah. how you get, you know, um, the procurement people, the R&D people, the corporate people, the government people, the, the entrepreneurs, the venture capitalists, all working toward a vision. Yeah. We've been talking about that for a long time. Uh, no, no. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, please. And, and just for what it's worth, just recently, uh, you're not allowed to do any new product development in Nestle unless procurement's at the table. Mm -hmm. ah. Because 
up until we, we talk about procurement being involved in new product development and making sure that we bring the innovative ideas both that the suppliers can bring and also get the cascade down from the business in terms of the vision going forward. It's only recently that we've actually said you cannot have a new product unless somebody from procurement is sitting at the table because we can bring that extra vision in terms of what's being developed and what the suppliers and where the innovation is going. Coming back on, on the packaging piece, I don't really know very well, but on the, on the vegetable oil side of things, part of our role is actually helping the refiners get the visibility to say, you know what, there's a market out there. And even though we, we think we're pretty big, we buy 0.7% of all of the world's palm oil. Even we don't have leverage with the refiners. But you know what, we, say, we think there's enough of us who actually want to have segregation or we want to have traceability or we want to have all of the, the good things that we want to know about where this palm has been grown, that we're not destroying peatlands and all this sort of stuff. And we're trying to build the business case so that the refiners actually make the move. Because without them, yeah. we've got no, no leverage. Now, one of the things, I would, a piece of advice I'd give to you is go find some business school guy or gal to write up the story of why procurement's at the table in new product development. I swear to God, like, the great thing about business is it's, 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 it loves copycatting more than anything else, right? And, and so if there's one good article about Nestle, you know, a great global company doing some cool thing, everybody and their cousin will read it and say, I can do that, that, uh, uh, that too. But if it's not kind of written up by somebody and, and put in Harvard Business Review or something, then it'll be forever. Uh, so go find somebody and write it up, okay? There you go. There, was, there a, was there a question at the back? Or a thought? Yes, go ahead. Tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Fiona Smith. So I lead the mobile and agricultural program at the, the GSMA, which is a trade association for the mobile industry. So working across the globe with mobile phone operators and agricultural partners to look at some of the um, challenges that you've spoken about here. I think one of the two things, I think one of the first comments was around um, has to be an increase in productivity, but surely efficiency is something that's incredibly important as well. So one of the questions is around tools. Have you guys looked at mobile as a tool, particularly around um, smallholder farmers and how you know that tool can be used to provide the information or uh, financial services that they need to be part of this system? We have a um, program called LaborLink um, that's a SMS-based tool, and it's used in two ways. Um, one is something we just started in Uganda with um, 4,000 smallholder farmers, where um, it's a really interesting situation because there's a market for their coffee, but the coffee's too variable in quality, and so no one can kind of count on it. And so we got a grant to go help the farmers get to a more consistent quality and develop better business practices. But because we're starting at ground zero, we could bring in this labor link phone technology and do a baseline survey of saying, where are you on a few things like output, cupping scores, um, um, uh, uh, sales price, those kinds of things, but also questions around um, how often is your family hungry, how often are your children in school, whatever. And we're actually partnering with the Green, Grameen Bank to implement it because they have the right on the ground people. And that's one then, and, and we hire people in the local community to act as the aggregator of this information. And so that's one where then we can go back over the course of this project and see, do these key metrics start to increase? So it's a little bit different than when you're talking about because this is more from the impact lens. Um, we also use this tool in factory settings as a way to find out um, your support. Nike thinks they're sourcing from a factory that's paying minimum wage. And guess what? Maybe they're not. And so this allows workers to actually be able to say, um, no, I didn't know I was supposed to get that wage, et cetera. And the, the Nike's the one that cares maybe more than the intermediary, but now this gives a tool to bring voice to that. So that's one of the ways we're experimenting with that. Can I just add yeah, something yeah. on it? So, so Phones are used a lot in rural areas that are on prices and, and actually has really made markets much more transparent about what the actual prices are 50 kilometers down the road. Uh, and that's, that's brought great benefits. But I think there's also now the beginning to, of using phones more for ag extension. Uh, Madagascar has got a system where there's been 2 million calls that have come in from rural areas about disease, diagnostics, about better practices, about those kinds of things. 
Uh, we've just been in discussion with China where a third of the aquaculture producers in China aren't even permitted. Uh, they don't have a license to operate. And, and what we're suggesting is that the government give them all phones and in exchange for the phone, they have to get a license. But then through the phones, you talk to the farmers about how to feed animals in aquaculture more efficiently, how to reduce uh, nitrogen going down the river because most of these are carp, which are fed, the feed for carp is nitrogen, which uh, causes phytoplankton blooms in the water. So, I mean, it's, it's those kind of things where you can link these things together. But I think really there's, there's an even another area where this could be very interesting and that is getting Intel to do a kind of Intel outside chip that would go into a phone so that phones around the world would start reporting up data that could be used to model climate change impacts on weather variability. If you got temperature, altitude, location, um, humidity, barometric pressure, all those things could be done without even sending. It would automatically uplink. And you could then begin to correlate that with weather patterns in the past and then start to predict weather pa patterns going forward. That sounds like social fiction to me. <laughs> 10 years ago, it would have been. <laughs> but Zurich Re and Swiss Re were in discussion with because, you know, would they put $200 million into something that they're paying out claims of something on the order of 30 to $40 billion of weather variability? Yeah. Um, this is real time information as well. So, you know, the, the data that you can actually have from the field to, you know, to your point, know exactly what's going on, right. you know, the potential disruption that could be uh, provided through mm -hmm. that, I think it's going to be phenomenal. I'm inclined to, okay, we'll do, we'll do one more and then, uh, then I'm, I'm inclined to go on to the second uh, question. Uh, Mike will come down from behind. Oh, just did. Right here. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks. So, hi, I'm Michael Chertok from Digital Divide Data. Maybe this is a link towards the, the second question about um, pre-competitive markets. Um, the question is about the opportunity and value created by producer alliances and trade associations. And um, the question is, comes from our organization. Um, we're looking at a variant of sustainable sourcing, um, which we call impact sourcing, which is using the opportunity for digital work to create jobs and, and opportunity at the base of the pyramid. Um, our organization started doing this in places like Cambodia. We're now doing it in Kenya. And we've seen that there, there are now about two dozen organizations around the world that are part of this $200 billion business process outsourcing industry that happens in a few cities in, in India and the Philippines that's now coming to Africa and coming to Southeast Asia and, and, and other, other places. Um, we're starting to organize. Um, we're starting to talk to each other and looking at, at collaborating. And we've learned so many other lessons from the fair trade movement and, and other folks who are doing sustainable sourcing with products. I'm curious, as we start to form alliances and trade associations, what are the, what, where have you seen the value? What are the opportunities so that we can become more competitive as a sector? So, so I, like that, I like that question. Before we, before we, before we go, uh, go to the answer of that in the pre-competitive markets, I, mean, I just wanted to uh, you know, set, kind of summarize on this one. I, 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 this has certainly got me thinking. I mean, it feels to me as though there's some, again, listening to what I heard about Nestle, the farm, these decision farms, there's sort of a meta structure of tools that are not widely available, like in many industry, like in, in software tools that develops, there, there are these tools available and everybody just la da I'm gonna use the tool and off I go. And that there are some tools, uh, but not a sort of a comprehensive set of tools out there that makes your job much easier rather than much harder. Right now you have a much harder uh, job to do the thing you wanna do, right? We, I already, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's already clear you wanna do the thing, but we, we, uh, have not provided you with tools that make it easier, so you've got to do it yourself. And, it, and anyway, I'm, I'm going to do some thinking on this. Is that what is the structure of tools? Could we create a map of the tools and start sort of filling in the tools and say, do we have tools for the procurement guy that sort of are more vertical that helps that helps him uh, make the case internally? Do we have horizontal tools that help a bunch of suppliers get together and do the do the right thing? What's the kind of quilt of kind of tools that we need to have? And I think, you know, I would argue that in some sense, the Skoll Foundation has funded the development of various tools without necessarily yet having a picture of what all that, what the map of tools needs to look like. And I'd like to have a, like, here's where 10 years from now, we need a tool, tools of various sorts in all the boxes 
uh, and if we spurred those, then it would be dead easy for us to walk into, after you show up at the school forum, we can, we, no, we could say, and here's, here's the tools that we have off the shelf that makes the job you want to do easier. Not easy, but at least easy, easier rather than, rather than uh, harder. So anyway, that, the yep. Might be, uh, that might be what Autodesk is doing now for, you know, their design tools to yep. build buildings and cities and yep. towns yep. and roads. They're embedding in an open source way all of this sustainability information so that the designers who are yep. using the tools yep. can get that information and data and make those calculations That's while they're in the design phase. Great. So it's a, And it makes yeah. it easier for yeah. them to be sustainable and harder for them to not be in some sense. Whereas the reverse is now, without those tools, you have to work really, really hard, unique ways yeah, they're, to they're try and do it. external instead of integral to the design process. Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. So anyway, I, that, this may be just my you know, crazy head, but that's what I, that's what I, that's what I took away from. Uh, from that, so so uh, on the pre-competitive market, the thoughts thoughts on the on the question. Yeah. Yeah. So what I would say is, um, we really work with two kinds of organizations to aggregate small farmers. One is the cooperative, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and one we call um, a market access partner, which could be a mill or some intermediary in the supply chain for small farmers who don't want or can't be part of a cooperative. Um, and the benefits that we see are, in general, when farmers can aggregate, of course they can get better prices with fewer middlemen. You can create more transparency so that they know from the co-op to the farm, you know, kind of what the difference in the price was. Um, it's a more efficient way to deliver services. So when you talk about some of your agronomy services, there's sort of a central place to go to and you can do train the trainer programs and you can have trusted people in the community delivering solutions. And then a huge one is finance, access to working capital. Um, we work a lot with root capital, but we also work with um, Funders like the Kellogg Foundation, the fellow here from the Kellogg Foundation is funding us in Chiapas to get working capital financing to these farmers so that what will often happen is in the middle of a harvest cycle, someone will be short on cash if the co-op or the market access partner doesn't have it and doesn't have the working capital. The farmer takes cash on the dollar for a fraction of what he would get if working capital was available. So those are a few of the things. Um, the other piece that happens that's a little bit unique to fair trade is that when you're in the co-op or in this market access partner structure, um, the individual farmers democratically elect people to form a fair trade committee, and then those committees decide how they want to invest some of the additional income from fair trade. And so what it does is it creates this harder to measure but long-term benefit of enabling farmers to work together to solve their own problems and to make their decisions on, hey, is the extra income, should we invest that in changing the way we mill coffee to save gallons of water? Should we invest it in a scholarship program for our schools? Um, you know, those are, those are choices that they're now being making and implementing themselves. So I'd be happy to talk to you in more depth offline, but those are a few of the benefits we've seen. It's interesting, you know, uh, you know uh, Mike, Mike Porter, who did the, th the presentation the other night, he's been working on industries like forever, and I've been working with him forever. Uh, as, as well, and so he's got all these in, like smart things he'll he'll just observe about industries, and and, and on this pre-competitive point, he he says for himself it's a mark of the sophistication of an industry uh, if they compete vigorously with each other for customers and cooperate on everything else, right? As it, he's, uh, he's, he's, he said that that's his mark. It's an unsophisticated industry if they say we're not going to cooperate on anything because they're our enemies, uh, and. Uh, and it's a not a sophisticated or, or, or well-functioning f uh, industry uh, if they don't compete with each other vigorously for customers. Uh, but if they do both, compete vigorously and cooperate on everything else, uh, on you know, developing standards for the, for the uh, industry, developing pools of labor and, and, and all of those things, that's the most sophisticated industry. So I was just thinking as you were asking your question that, that uh, that's, a, that's a Mike, uh, Mike Porterism. So there's what what's interesting at least when when you look at from the outside looking in how you might affect change you know you've got the producers and then you've got the retailers and brands on the demand side and we kind of look at those two ends of it but the critical the biggest pinch point in this whole thing is the traders mm -hmm. yeah. and they have little interest to change because in fact everything you're asking them to do is counter to everything that makes a trading system efficient so 
commodities were created right after the Industrial Revolution to substitute one ton of something for another ton. Interchangeable products. I mean, that's what they were for. You strip away who produced it, how they produced it, where they produced it, what the impacts were. You don't want to know that. You want to know that it's substitutable. And that, not carrying all that information makes it cheaper, yeah. makes it efficient. Yeah. Well, now we're asking well, just the opposite. Be now we're asking to bring all that information back in. Yeah. The question is how you scale that up. Yeah. How you influence the trading companies, so let's take palm oil for example. We convinced 12 of Cargill's 15 largest companies to ask for sustainably produced certified palm oil. Once they asked Cargill for that, and six of them walked away from Cargill and stopped buying from them, Cargill came out with a strategy on palm oil. So we've got to learn how to leverage this system better. But they still needed a certification program, et cetera. And the, and the issue then becomes, is there a way to get entire landscapes moving into more sustainable production rather than setting up parallel traceability systems which are incredibly inefficient and costly? Uh, and, and most no, virtually all of the benefit goes along the way to everybody but the producers who made the difference to actually be certified. And so that's the, a big challenge right now is how to make, how to get to scale at a landscape level where everybody in a, in a region is certified and therefore all the product is de facto segregated because it's 95% it's of it or whatever is produced against standards. That's the challenge. Interesting. And that would presumably end up being much lower cost. So if you had, well, five, if you had five big manufacturers who used that, they would be much better off. If the exactly, whole, the whole because thing then was, it literally, the price could actually go down. Yeah. And it would be more sustainable. And the producers would actually make more. Yeah. I mean, that's what you start looking at, whole different economics. But the book and claim system in green energy is a potential way to make that happen within five or 10 years. That's so, about so how long it takes. Explain more about what. So book and claim, basically, you, we don't have parallel energy systems for green energy versus all the other energy. When you sell energy onto the grid, you get to sell credits for green energy. And that's the book and claim mechanism. Yep. Well, we've adapted that to commodities and used the same kind of approach to commodities. But at some point, when you get 60, 70, 90% of commodity as being certified in a certain area, then virtually all of that commodity is segregated. The system, the book and claim system, allows you to recognize that production without physically segregating the product. Yeah, yeah. But you want to put a timeline on it. You want, say, within five years or 10 years, you want X percent to be certified so you can sell it then as a certified product. And, and we haven't quite, we don't have agreement on this. It's yeah. kind of controversial because it's not all transparent, it's not traceable in the same way, but it will be transformative much faster much cheaper and forever. What would it take for the big cocoa users or the big coffee users to get together in that sort of way? Is that a pipe dream or is that doable or? I think the, the two examples you've just given for me in the world that I live in are 180 degrees apart from each other. Mm -hmm. um, coffee has a round table it's called the 4C Association. You have producer organizations, you have NGOs, you have traders, and you have end users like us all sitting around the one table saying, here's a code of conduct that we believe is appropriate and should be baseline sustainability from which farmers then can build and move forward. For me, the 4C Association is this round table opportunity of an industry working together. COCO is driven primarily by trade organizations or other commercial operations who've set themselves up and branded different sustainability programs and they've all acted independently of each other wow. and they've, they had invested too much to come back to say, let's have a round table because they've wow. all got something intrinsic that they've invested in. Oh, okay. So for me, Coco, and m there might be people who disagree, but for me, Coco has not evolved yeah. to the same level of maturity as an industry yeah. to say, what do we all agree in? Yeah. And maybe it might take the government of Ivory Coast or Mrs. Watara or somebody to actually say, here's some standards that we should be believing in and uh -huh. force the others to work towards it. I'm not sure. So the but question is, who, can, who, could, 
who could motivate the change? And you're saying maybe it's the, in this case it's closer to the yeah. production. Like sometimes it might be it might be closer to the market that's farther away from the market that time. We had an interesting discussion earlier um, about how do we make certification mainstream, yeah. and and four C for me bridges that gap yeah. because it's a continuous improvement program. Yeah. You say if you sign up, these things are immediately excluded and we'll work towards improving yeah. and, and potentially at the end of that, you're ready for certification. And do you know enough about the history of it to know what was the catalytic event? Did it, was it some yeah. corporation or? Uh, like 2001 and 2002 coffee prices hit the, the lowest price ever yeah. and farmers were destitute. They yeah. could not make a living out of coffee. Yeah. And the question was, what can we do as an industry? What can we do? And when I say industry, it's not, end user industry, it's the, the coffee industry as a whole, yep. about ensuring that coffee f families involved in coffee production have a, a, a viable um, fiscal future. Ah, okay. Otherwise, coffee, would di coffee, coffee supply would disappear. People were ripping it out of the ground and replacing it with other crops. But what's okay. interesting is that yeah. these, these two examples really, we talked about this yesterday, two, or two days ago, whenever it was, uh, really kind of fly in the face of, of conventional wisdom because Two countries control 70% of the world's cocoa. Six companies probably control 80% of the cocoa use. And so it's so concentrated, you would think you could actually make a change in cocoa, and yet you can't because I think there's more competition when there are fewer. With, with, you know, there's, what, how many, how many dozens of countries that sell coffee? How many, you know, millions of people? It's the second largest, or it used to be second largest traded commodity, it's changed, but, but it's just, it's, it's a much more complicated beast than cocoa. Cocoa is relatively simple, but we can't get it to change. <laughs> and, and I think the only thing I'd add on is the 4C model is good and interesting, um, and how do you ensure enough progress to the outcomes that you want? Um, and if everyone, start, getting them enrolled is great, um, you know, if, if we stayed at, four, at the baseline of 4C for too long, I don't think anyone would be happy with the outcome. So that's, that's the other challenge is that when you get this started, it, it has to have this mechanism for improvement. So that's one of the reasons I think that 4C actually worked because it was the first time where there was a tacit acknowledgement that having certified up here and having uncertified here is just not a viable model. You've got to have a stepwise approach or an escalator that allows producers to get better over time. And 4C is a step down here. And there are other steps here and there are other steps here. But we need that escalator. And, and even just something like legal, legal products as the first step on that escalator would be huge. It would affect every commodity globally. Yeah, which is always a trade-off, right? You know, people can say, oh, that's not fast enough, uh, and you can get attacks from, uh, from that, but at least getting on the escalator, it sounds like Coco is not on any kind of escalator right now. It's not well, we like, got to be careful that that perfect doesn't get in the yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, that's, that's what I was getting at. And that's the perfect yeah. actually moved markets way slower than the good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you made the point earlier about waste in the supply chain. Yeah. Coco, because it's not a round table. I'm paying much higher premiums for cocoa and getting less result flowing through to the farmer. Mm -hmm. ah. So Can we quote you on that. Mm -hmm. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Ah, interesting, interesting. Anybody else who had their hand up for, the, uh, for, for this issue that has uh, uh, thought they'd uh, like to put? Yeah, sure. Tell, and tell us who you are. Yeah, I'm uh, Stephen Huttert from the McConnell Family Foundation in Montreal. Oh, excellent. We are uh, grantor. Hey. Grantors and impact investors in uh, in food systems in Canada, yep. and a couple of observations uh, and questions, I guess, for the panel. One is around the use of life cycle analysis, and we belong to a conference board uh, table where CEOs of food companies get together regularly to formulate formulate uh, uh, policy and strategy. And uh, in, a, in a recent conversation, this question of life cycle analysis came up, and they said, "We all do it." But we don't share that information because we regard it as competitive. Uh, and that so, goes right to the heart of this. So, yeah. so the question is, you know, what is the policy lever? What is the where is the industry leadership apart from Walmart? You know, I, so Walmart was raised, 
And the response was, well, you know, Walmart is forcing people to do that. We wouldn't like to do that. But, you know, we had Pepsi, Nestle, all of the big national, international companies were represented at the table. But there wasn't this, there was one more push needed, I think, to get companies to do that. The second part is, what's the consumer facing, <coughs> the consumer facing part of this? Uh, right now, consumers are very confused about what's local, what's regional, what's organic, et cetera. There's a, there's a kind of profusion of certification and terms out there that um, seem to be clouding the issue, and, and I think we're losing the opportunity to use market forces to drive this. And, and that, you know, it's another question, I think, for people doing this kind of work. And I just want to finish with the story of something called This Fish, which is an interesting innovation in this space, uh, operated by Ecotrust in, uh, in BC that links consumers via a telephone uh, website, an app, to the actual fishermen who caught their fish. So you see a picture of the boat, the community, uh, what day was the fish caught, uh, do you want some recipes? And it creates a relationship mm -hmm. that I think is part of what decommodifies the, the, you know, is part of what gets us to this new place, is that I have a relationship with the actual farmer. I can see it, I could go there if I wanted to. I think there's, there's an opportunity there to use the power of North American markets to model some of the behaviors we'd like to see in the global south. So questions and Neat, neat story. Yeah, oh, yeah. shoot, that, Will. Um, your, your comments and your questions make me think immediately to the experience I just had a couple of weeks ago at the uh, natural product show in Anaheim, um, where Whole Foods announced that in 2018 they were going to mandate that every product sold on their shelves needed to be labeled for GMO. Uh, and this flew, you know, immediately in the face of, we had, what was it, Proposition 37? 37. 37 in California, which had a groundswell of consumer um, support to label, and then just a massive uh, amount of money by the National Grocery Association um, and all the manufacturers to, to kill it and basically slow it down. Because I, I think it was not so much that manufacturers were against it. They just don't know what to do. They don't know how to secure their supply chains in a way that they can comply with that. So it made me think a lot about the role of leadership. And Whole Foods, it's interesting, as their value proposition as being a differentiated retailer has eroded over the years as Safeway and Walmart, as people have adopted organic, they, they again took a bold, um, you know, leap and said, we're going to lead. I mean, it's in their self-interest. It's competitive advantage. But it's just really interesting to me how all of that played out. And you know, now all the major food companies in the world at least own a couple of brands um, that are sold through Whole Foods. So General Mills owns Cas Cascadian Farms, and right. you know, Coke owns Odwalla. And so it's going to force the procurement people to start thinking about, you know, and so the people that are in those little sub companies are going to have to start thinking, how are we going to comply? And hopefully that will have a ripple effect through the whole system. Yeah, I just I want to draw a little picture, because I think it's, it's useful on this LCA thing. And, and LCAs are a great tool for where you're actually working. And the people who do LCAs, the companies, et cetera, uh, tend to, to focus. It, so you have to be very careful about what the parameters are, what the methodologies are, because not all LCAs are created like the TSC, the Sustainability Consortium, is trying to do LCAs and, and get that work forward. But we had a, a, a person that we asked to, to look at this. And basically, if you take this as the producer and this as the kind of end of life along this continuum, LCAs are actually really good in terms of credibility at the manufacturer and brand. And, it, and they're less good on these other issues. Impacts are like this, though. So LCAs are kind of not the right tool for the right problem. And we just have to be aware. LCAs, why? 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 LCAs don't why? look at deforestation. Okay. They don't touch deforestation. They don't use prior land use. They don't deal with any of those issues. Gotcha. So that's, that's a kind of, they look at recyclability. They don't look at percent recycled. You know, that's kind of thing. So we yeah. just have to be careful that the tool is fit for purpose. Yeah, yeah. What is it we're trying to maximize? If you look at a company like Tetra Pak in terms of just, just greenhouse gas emissions, it goes like this. So 6% of the emissions on their supply chain, they control in scope one. 35% are downstream, 10% are end of life, and about 
44% are in the production of, of pulp. So instead of them focusing on this, they decided to focus on where they buy their pulp from because that has a bigger greenhouse gas emissions impact than if they eliminated their entire greenhouse gas emissions entirely just to get this changed by 15%. So anyway, it's, it's how to think about these yeah, issues. Yeah, yeah. No, no. no, it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting. Yeah, because my previous misspent youth as a strategy consultant, I, uh, I, that was often the case in cost reduction efforts. People would attempt to cost reduce things and end up not realizing they're cost reducing a tiny little piece and leaving completely alone under, under, under the lamp because that's where the light's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, it's interesting that you, you find the same, the same right. phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Part of your comment about farmer connection, um, we've seen that work a lot, and it, it, it really is about um, giving consumers the amount of information they're ready and then letting them dig deeper. So for example, we found just in social media, if you have a picture of a farmer with a quote, a little bit about the product, even if it's not the exact product you bought, um, that gets not only a lot of likes, but a lot of double clicks. So then they can go and they can eventually get to the producer profile and they can get to that next level. But the key is to deliver it in um, a way that lets the consumer go deeper when she's ready and not try and force too much information right from the start. That's what we found. Deborah. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think a lot of these issues we've been talking about in the last few minutes are related to measurement and transparency, yes. which was your next issue. Yep. So maybe we could spend a couple yeah, of yeah. the last minutes yep. on that. Sure. Thoughts on that? Anybody on the panel want to? Uh, I have a question for yeah. this group, which is, and you know, to Mary Jo and what Jason has spent so many years doing is this certification process and the branding of certifications and the fragmentation of certifications, the confusion around certifications, and the escalator of changing certification. Where, you know, in your guys' view, where is this going? Um, how do how are we going to connect this whole supply chain? in a way that the certification is meaningful to the, the whole e ecosystem. Yeah, so I, you know, full disclosure, I've been at Fair Trade USA for about two and a half years, and you guys could probably teach me as much as anything that I can teach you. But I'll tell you, coming in um, as a relative outsider, um, I think where certification has to go is, um, Maybe the car industry is not the best analogy, but a common chassis with then a little bit of late stage differentiation. And so when you look at all of these things, whether they're organic or fair trade or rainforest or 4C or whatever, you have, if you were to work at a principle level instead of a rule level, you would find that there is tremendous overlap in principles and there is, um, but there's tremendous difference in rules in, in terms of the standard. Well, the way I think we should achieve this is a standard that says this with a compliance criteria that looks like that, that has this time horizon to achieve. And so, so no, 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 the way I think we should achieve this, da, da, da. And part of the reason I'm guessing is that it, you have a landscape like this is because, um, first of all, the ultimate people doing the certification, you know, this is like, uh, check, check, check. So the more specific it is, then the lower cost it is to actually, you know, you don't need as much thinking and interpretation. So I'm guessing that's one of the root causes. I think another root cause is because most of these sprung up to deal with a very narrowly defined issue and then maybe added a few things on over time. And so I fundamentally believe that one of the innovations in this space has to be, um, whether it's an open source or some sort of standardization of a common chassis with a high enough bar that deals with economic, social, and environmental sustainability. And then if that's the base, and then for some reason there needs to be a little bit of differentiation off the base, then, then so be it. And then the application of technology. As far as I can tell, this is still a clipboard and pencil business um, you know, in a world where everyone has a mobile phone. So that's, that's my thinking. So let me tell a little story, because I think it illustrates at least where <laughs> where I would like to see this go, and I think inevitably it will kind of inch its way there. In the 30s, and then disrupted a little bit in the 40s because of the war, and then picking up again in the late 40s and 50s, we had a proliferation of health and safety labels all over the world. Mm -hmm. Local, regional, national, international, around this thing, around that thing, et cetera. We eventually ended up with the Codex Alimentarius, 
and that was a global, minimal kinds of health standards that you had to meet for international trade. I think we are evolving towards more government-controlled standards at the national level, and inevitably we will probably be headed towards a Codex Planetarius kind of situation, where you'll need minimal certain requirements for international trade. Uh, but, so that's, that's one thing, but I think the shift that's important also when it gets to the metrics issue is that most certification programs today, and I think the thinking is evolving and needs to as we go forward, is about practices. It's about means, not ends. And that's why it's easy to check. Did you do X? Did you use Y? Did you do Z? Sophisticated programs are going to require performance. And they're going to say, this is the bar. We don't care how you get there. Every farmer's got different assets. They have a different amount of capital, different amount of labor, or different amount of machinery. They have different soil. They'll all get there in different ways, but they gotta achieve the bar. You might even have national interpretations because some places may be harder to do some things than others. Fine, recognize it and get on with it, but measure it. It's gonna be more about measurement and less about, about practices. But there is another little thing here that, that's actually affecting this, and that, that's where the increased consumption's coming from. There, Certification programs will represent values, you know, I mean, they, what we put a value in, why some people got started, why some programs got started, focusing on one or two things. So we did a survey, uh, or hired a company rather, to do a survey in China last summer. In the, in the US, 75% of Americans would rather find a cure for cancer than solve environmental problems. In China, 75% of Chinese would rather fix environmental problems than solve a, find a cure for cancer. Cultures are different and they will value different things. Um, and in fact, in this case, given the environmental causes of cancer, maybe it's yeah, better yeah. to solve the environment. Okay. <laughs> but I think we need to look at where these growing markets are moving and where they're moving yeah. us and what will resonate in those markets. James. Um, I'm curious, there's so much conversation around the multinationals. I don't know what percentage of the global economy the multinationals are, but I'm, I'm not sure that actually solves the problem, but you might know those statistics. So, we developed a strategy about how to have an impact on those biggest threats to the environment as we saw them, and, and we basically see agriculture as the biggest threat, global threat to the environment. If we don't get producing food and fiber right, we can turn out the lights and go home. So the 35 places that we think are the most important, there are 15 commodities that the production is kind of moving into those places that's having an impact on them. Of those 15 commodities, three to 500 companies control about 60 to 80% of the trade of each of those commodities. But if you dig more deeply, 100 companies touch 25% of the trade of all 15 of the, those commodities. And 25% of demand, if you can shift those 100 companies, actually will shift 40 to 50% of producers who compete to sell into those markets. So multinationals have a certain role, but as I've just said, the traders also have a certain role, and lots of people have different roles, and so uh, we have to work both ends against the middle, the middle against both ends. I mean, whatever it takes, I think. I think. But, but business has got to be part of the solution. And right now, in the global recession, we're finding that, that business is far more interested in their raw material supplies, and, the, and not a reputational risk so much, but just a, a risk of not having a business than they've ever been. And governments are asleep at the wheel. Last year, two-thirds of the world's population was in an election cycle. What, what's going to happen in an election site? Nothing. So, I mean, they're, they're just, and China goes on. And it's not just China. China's just kind of at the head of things. But um, it's, we, we need to get this, we need tourniquets, and we got a whole lot of little Band-Aids. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of where the how to think thing comes, I think. It seems like the extreme weather events, too, are raising the awareness that we're one or two harvests and, and, away from just and that being didn't out of even come up. And a commodity. So yeah. a lot of companies are setting up double supply chains to mitigate risk from being not being able to get raw materials. So, well, 
That sounds very efficient from their point of view, and it is, but it's really inefficient from a global managing the planet point of view because you're gonna get things tied up. And companies are also, and this is, I think, very significant for all of our work, companies have a larger and larger portion of their raw, raw material supplies where they're locking in three, five, 10. Coke has 20 year contracts on raw materials mm -hmm. for some things. Not price, because that has to be fairly kind of, you know, you've gotta figure out a formula for price, but volumes and qualities. Because they know that if they don't lock it in now, they may not get it. Well, that means there's a partnership and now the producer can go to the bank and borrow money at two to 5% lower rates because they actually have a forward contract. The other thing about weather variability is that banks haven't figured out how to deal with finance yet. And so one of the things that we're working with them is three to five year working loans. Because we need working capital that amortizes risk over a longer period of time rather than one year. One year drought, next year flood, two years failure. Who's gonna lend for the third year? We've gotta to begin to start thinking about those issues and banks more than anybody. You mean banks haven't got it all figured out? Hmm. Imagine what you learn in a time like this. My school colleague here. Hi, I'm Ana Sacapa. Um, I wanted to see if we can talk a little bit about how we're going to pay for these things. Like, where there seems to be different levels of intervention some are at the basic farmer training, others are more at the government regulation, but I just can't, I don't see where, like where is the capital for all of this going to come from? And so I want to see if you can talk about that. Yeah. You're trying to raise and then deploy some of that will? Well, I mean, I, I guess I would say it in a couple of ways. Um, a fair trade, with the revenue that we earn, because most of our money comes from businesses paying us a fee to do this work, we can grow 10 to 15% a year of a really small base. And that would not be fast enough to make the kind of differences that we're all talking about here. So there is a real huge question, like for us, from an enabling perspective, where you get capital to really scale this, given that we're a nonprofit. So that, you know, is just a, a factor of being a nonprofit. But I think from a business perspective, I think it goes back to some of the things both of these guys said about this is an investment, not a cost. And some of our more sophisticated business partners understand that. Um, one of our largest customers has a um, new CEO, a recently new CEO, and I was with him a couple of weeks ago. And he said, you know, and he's worked in large companies for a long time. And he said, you know, what makes sense to me about what we're doing with fair trade is it creates sustainability for the farmer from an economic and an environmental and a social perspective, which then creates sustainability in my supply chain. So he really got the idea that fair trade was an investment for him, not just an extra cost, just like if you'd invest in other supply chain initiatives. And this particular company is already kind of wired for sustainability, so it's easier. I mean, it's it's not like he was starting from scratch. But I, I think some of this is um, how do you make the case for companies that this is an investment? Yeah, and I think the investment has to be linked to at the end, if it's a company, it's got to be linked to strategic competitive advantage. Yeah. So it can't just be. It's not altruistic. It yeah, has right, to have right, a case. And, and back what I said earlier. I mean, one of the big companies we've worked with, they've, they've deployed close to a billion dollars over the last 10 years in venture capital, in outside innovation, investing in, e in the ecosystem to discover and commercialize the, the innovations that they know, you know can't be invented there. I think one of the big breakthroughs that's happened in, in, in corporate competitiveness in the last few years is just the recognition that they can't do everything themselves and that they're not independent and they have to cooperate. So I think, you know, so I think, I think corporations themselves are a really interesting piece of um, a source of capital. Um, you know, I think the, 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 for, the people that come to this forum are really interesting. A lot of the debate I heard around here just listening in was that, you know, there's a group of people that want cor foundations to deploy more of their corpus toward, you know, mission-related investing, and the foundations are saying, but, but we're really here to make grants to the, 
to the non-market base, you know, that just aren't going to be solved. So that's just really interesting. So I would love to see a consortium of the biggest foundations in the world get together. I mean, we, we could organize a half a billion dollar fund pretty easily if we could get those 20 foundations to actually talk to each other and say, we're going to really focus, we're going to make a fund on sustainable sourcing, and we're going to have a 20 year you know, time frame, and we're going to invest in the tools and the technologies and to do this. But, but no, that doesn't fit our mandate because we define sustainability you know, in terms of sustainable markets or people. And no, we do it because it's about agriculture. You know, so we, we don't have a big enough tent. We want the corporations to get together and work together. <laughs> not a, no. <laughs> so it's got to be through. It's got to be through some leadership at the at the level. And and the McConnell Foundation in in Canada, which I've recently learned about, is pr you know I think one of those that's starting to think about the role of a foundation, not just in leading their own you know vertical, but you know thinking bigger on a systems level about how do we really get people you know, cooperating in that way. On, on that front, that, that does relate to the, the other, the fourth big, big issue we talked about. I, I, I'd, I'd be interested in talking a little bit about that, because it does, I mean, it, it, it's something that always worries me, too, which is, which is the, the great cosmic adverse selection problem out, out there, which is, and where this would be a manifestation of it, right, which is, chances are, that the that the companies showing up at this at this conference are the ones at the top of the curve who are doing good things like Nestle shows up because they're trying to be really good and the ones that the ones that aren't here and say boy that's a dumb way to spend 3 days are the ones that uh, that you you know you identified and are are, are worried about what what uh, so what can you do on that front? So there's a the question. I mean yeah. it's interesting given given your last comment and and this yeah. this turn in the road um, so I haven't been going to many of the sessions here, I plead. Uh, I've been sitting in my room writing a prospectus, and it's called the China Fund. And we've got four foundations and three NGOs and two ministries in China that are pooling together to develop a strategy to change the trajectory of how China invests in resources globally and how they buy hard and soft commodities. Uh, and it's a $50 million fund. Uh, over five years that will be used specifically to leverage change within that. If anything, it is about moving the bottom yep. because that's who China has traditionally purchased from. China wasn't even a member of the WTO until 94. Uh, it bought from failed states, it bought from conflict states, it bought from dictatorships. It is currently buying from resource frontiers. The impacts of those purchases have huge uh, are huge. And so we need to change that trajectory. And, and part of that is education, part of its capacity, part of it is risk issues that China needs to look at. Uh, but, but that is one. The other side of that, though, and it does go back to the business case. In all the evidence that we've generated, and we're working with 100,000 cotton producers in India and Pakistan uh, and getting them up to a better cotton initiative kind of um, verification program. Over the last five years, they've reduced water use by 60%, pesticides by 50%, and, um, and fertilizers by 40%, and they've increased productivity by 30%, increasing net profit because of efficiency by 26%. All the evidence that we've got shows that the producers that become certified actually manage things that matter, and they become more efficient. So when I use the term productivity, don't confuse that with yield or production. Productivity is an efficiency measure by definition. It's productivity per amount of land, per liter of water, per pound of fertilizer, per hour of labor. Uh, it's all those things. And that's why we need to move to productivity, not just yields. So I have a suggestion. Buddy system. All right, the good news about being at the very top of the curve is that the only people that are at the top of the curve are there partially for business reasons and partially because they believe it's the right thing to do, right? They wouldn't be right at the top of the curve if, if, if they're not. Uh, create an ethic in, in, in each industry where the person at the top of the curve is matched up with the person at the bottom of the curve and sees as part of their, their role in life and making the world a better place is to teach, teach them how to not be at the bottom of the, the curve. Like I think it, in some sense, it's far-fetched, right? You know, why would they want to spend their time doing that? But, but the good news is they're only at the top because they, they believe 
Uh, and if you could have that in some organized uh, uh, fashion, you might be able to pull up the bottom uh, faster than anything else because they'd have the intellectual tools, the technologies, the stuff that, that, would, uh, that uh, you could transfer the fastest. So that would be my thought. Canadian A? Yeah, sure, mate. <laughs> um, um, I guess the uh, this this question of uh, putting larger amounts of capital behind this kind of change is an important one, and I do think philanthropic foundations have a role to play. But the the conversations have to be now, I think, between foundations and governments and corporate leadership, because these are uh, sort of this is the sort of all silos on deck moment. Yeah, yeah, okay? and, and it's part of, it's part of I, I think it's part of that model thing that, that you're saying it's got to be this broad right. model so yeah. in that Tools. context you know we're looking at for example a uh, an, Im a, an impact investment forum that aims at the the very very high end so we've so far impact investing has been about the sort of five to fifty million dollar range but we need to get up to the 500 to you know billions uh, into that range and an example of something we're looking at in that vein is a way of capitalizing on the use or monetizing the value of straw all of that uh, detritus that's left after the wheat the corn the rice has been harvested only 50 percent on average is needed to actually refertilize the soil the other 50 percent has actually got value as fiber we're looking at you know a program to start retrofitting pulp mills to produce fiber that can produce paper, that can produce clothing, uh, providing an income source to farmers that currently they don't have, uh, in a model for pulp mills that reduces water use and so on by 50% by the kinds of uh, things that you talk about. Yep. So there, there are these big sort of plays, I think, that are coming into focus now that require you know, enlightened investment, that require you know, government policy support, and, and a degree of boldness to just sort of move ahead. Yep. I think we're looking at similar things around the, the fisheries issues that WWF is looking at. How do we finance conservation uh, based on future yield uh, or yield recovery from endangered fish stocks? How do we make those investments today yep. in community viability and so on? So there's a whole other discussion, I think, that accompanies this one that comes from the impact investing world. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, uh, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's true. I mean, I guess I, I have a certain level of you know, of, of confidence that that the money follows the business models, and that if we can, if we can create, you know, really, really kind of crisp business models, uh, we've got it. We've we've got a shot. Foundations will get together, uh, and often you just you need the most risky tranche of capital uh, from somebody like like that, and then other people will will pile on. But it's it's. Uh, uh, but I think I think the key is having those those really sort of crisp business models. Yeah, I'll, I'll go to Will first, and then, and then Jason. I, I experienced um, just the the learning that takes place when you get the diversity of the perspectives around a board in a shared venture. For instance, one of one of the companies that I'm involved with is called Revolution Foods. It's bringing 200,000 healthy meals to school children. 80% of those reach underserved children. It's really it's a it's an intervention for diabetes and obesity childhood diabetes at scale now. It's really fantastic. What's interesting about it is the, the, the investor syndicate is impact investors, mainstream venture capital, and foundations. And I mean, it's a group of people that would have never sat around a table, a business, it's a business, and, you know, and grown it. And I just think the learning from that is, is so profound. So I think there's a lot to be said about this design of the syndicates and Who's gonna, you know, who's gonna lead and who's gonna create terms for these funds and these investments that are, you know, that, that, that you can really aggregate capital at that scale without people you know, imposing certain um, of their own very narrow, you know, egocentric desires, so. Uh. So I wanted to talk about something that's slightly different and it's about, I think there's a, there's a real value and, and you, what you said earlier uh, prompts this. I'm not sure anybody wants to be identified as the worst producer to go work with the best one. I think that's kind of a non-starter, and, and I don't even know who the best one would be either, much less the worst one. But I do think there's a real power in open source databases where it's a pay-to-play system. You, you get to use and access anonymous data by putting your own in. And, and that is a very powerful way for people to learn <laughs> anonymously about the business case for an investment or for a change or for 
other things. I can see that with farmers. I could see that with procurement officers. I could see that with, with, with others. We just finished a study with McKinsey and the Carbon Disclosure Project, which shows that we could reduce by a gigaton, maybe two in the US, just through investments in energy efficiency in existing companies. And what the data shows is that the investments that the companies make would give them the highest rate of return of any investment they could make as a company, even in their product line or R&D or advertising or whatever. They'd get a, a higher one. Now, if you couple that with an open source database so they can share the information about how they did it and, and what worked, that would be great. But we don't need to limit it, limit it to companies in this China fund that I mentioned. We're trying to create an open source database so that countries in Africa can access mineral rights agreements and get and know what the issues are, how to negotiate better agreements, bring Norway in and have them help set up a database about how to set up sovereign funds, how to invest present wealth for future wealth. Those are the kinds of things where you could share data. Or even around hydro, power purchase agreements are not public and yet how you negotiate the power purchase agreement has a huge amount to do with how profitable it is. So making an open source database where you could actually get access to that. People need to learn faster. Innovations today are taking eight to 10 years to get around. In an IT world, that's just crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, in some sense, maybe, a, 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 maybe I'm thinking too much, that's, those are tools. And those are tools in a way of deploying, yeah. deploying uh, tools. We have a tool for how to negotiate a uh, power a power contract if we can if we can have that we should and talk. it's for these people <laughs> right basically yeah. it's the, the, these people that's a nice little tool in that crazy quilt of tools uh, and and you're also speaking of how do you distribute the tool and make it right. uh, accessible I mean I think I think that bears a lot of thought of, of what are and it's sort of killer app time like what are the right. what are the killer apps out, out there that would would empower action what do they have to look like and in whose hands you're you're getting to the in whose hands do they have to quickly get or not quickly but sort of uh, readily uh, get and if you could if you could solve those two and just pick off the top right. the top 20 killer apps right. and have tools for each of them that might make a a huge difference in rolling things out and, and getting this happening faster. And I think it would also make yeah. it more transparent. Yes. I mean, yes, if yes, you yes, got yes, the yes, mineral yes. rights in the public domain, yeah. then you couldn't send half the money from Africa to Swiss banks. Yeah. You know, it'd have to stay in the country. No, 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 you're right. <laughs> what were we going to say? Well, well, that's what Richard Jefferson was really mm -hmm. getting into. But yes. I think this is your copycat strategy. I mean, yeah. it's sort of the yeah. early adopter, the sharing, yeah. spirit of sharing, and then people just copying as quickly copy, as possible. Copy, copy. Yeah, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Okay, it's, a, it's like 10 after. My, my thought is uh, we've done good here. <laughs> and and uh, I, I'd call it to that. Yes, thank you. Thank you to the panel. Great panel. Great panel. Thanks for all the, all the thoughts, all the, all the questions onward and upward. And I'll see you up at the new theater. <laughs>